What if you could help others to find the power to heal themselves, physically, emotionally, and spiritually? When I started teaching my classes, it was in 2002, and I was just doing the past life regressions and contacting the subconscious part. But then as the time went on and we found how powerful this was and what we could do with it, a lot of the students began saying, you know, advanced past life regression doesn't really tell what it's all about. This is so much more than that. We think you should change the name. So it was a few years ago, we decided to change the name to Quantum Healing Hypnosis Technique. And this is the healing technique that we've now been teaching it, well, since 2002, that's 12 years. What if you could time travel with them? Visit mythical places or angelic realms, other worlds, other galaxies. Help others to speak to their higher selves. You can. Dolores has taught thousands of people from across the world how to use QHHT and now you can learn her method by going directly to DoloresCannon.com and don't forget to mention the discount code MORETALKS. Welcome everybody to this World Satsang held on Saturday the 24th of November 2018 in conjunction with Kevin Moore and The Moore Show. And again, many thanks to Kevin for all the work he's doing in spreading the word, spreading the truth and exposing what appears to be mistruths as well in terms of understanding what the greater reality is. Last time I spoke to Kevin, by the way, he was still in the States doing the work on these uh, latest set of documentaries. So um, keep going, uh, Kevin, you're doing a great job. OK, so let's go to the agenda for this uh, this month's satsanga. First of all, there's a, a short talk by myself on how the frequencies hide what is not visible on the Earth and the physical universe. And then we've got um, <laughs> what's supposed to be 30 minutes of questions, but might end up being more like an hour. There's a lot of questions there. So, um, and a lot of good questions as well, which are specific, specifically aimed at understanding who and what we are and uh, understanding more about our greater reality. And then um, the end of meat meditation is a meditation to help us make the right decisions in life. And this is particularly important when we're faced with um, the dilemma of uh, going one way versus another, you know, having choice or choices to make when we move forwards. Okay, so the, the first part, um, how do the frequencies hide what's not visible uh, on the Earth and physical universe? Well, if you think, think of it in terms of uh, layers, um, in computer ID design, when we build something or we design something like a house or a car or an airplane or, or a piece of furniture or a piece of electronics like a computer, we put things on different levels. And um, we can either see all the levels together, which gives us a th um, quite a solid 3D image of what we're trying to design, or we can turn off certain la levels or layers and only see certain aspects of that design, such as with a motor car, it would be we can see the whole car, um, or we can just see the chassis or the body in white, or we can just see the electrical wiring uh, harness or loom, as we used to call it, or we can just see the powertrain, or we can just see the suspension, or we can just see the fuel system, um, or we can just see the, 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 the trim and hardware. And, and a similar thing for a house, you can, you, you can see the basic of the bricks, or you can see the, the woodwork inside, or you can see the central heating system, whichever system that's being used, and you can see the electrical system as well. So it's, so it's really about layers and layering and, how, and, and, and switching these things on and off. So if you use that as an, ex as an example, and then think of it in a, different, in a slightly different way, is the layers being, ex being a, a, appropriate to a certain frequency level, then you can see that if, you, if you're only able to switch on certain frequency levels, and in terms of the human eye, that will be the first three frequency levels. Mankind, well, scientific mankind calls them three dimensions, but my understanding is that dimensions are a much higher piece of structure than, the, than, than, than what is purport, purported to be dimensions. Uh, we actually live in a, frequency, in a frequential state within a dimension. Um, 
then you only see or experience what's in those, those three dimensions. Uh, sorry, three, sorry, those three frequencies. I'm getting dimensions myself now. Um, so in, in essence, we only see what is gross physical. Now, when we work on ourselves and we, we try to uh, experience more of our reality, more of our incarnate reality, we can raise our frequencies higher. Now, we do this via meditation, being of service to others, or other things doing various different workshops that are out there, uh, in including my own Traverse and the Frequencies workshops. And when we do this, we raise our frequencies. And as we raise our frequencies, we give ourselves the ability to access other levels or other layers, so to speak, of the physical universe. Now, for those of you who remember the, the information, this part of the history of God and, and the Beyond the Source books, you'll understand, and of course the, the Origin Speaks, you'll understand that the physical universe is the only universe that uses 12 frequencies to create it. And that's because they are all low frequencies. And so above the 12th frequency, a particular frequency itself will and does have the capability of housing a self-contained simultaneous universe in its own right. But the physical universe, which, which, which is within the first full dimension, everything else is in other dimensions, um, needs the, all of those frequencies associated with it. And so basically we have a condition where we, when we're incarnating, we only exposed to those levels. Now, if we're incarnating into a different frequency, for, this, this, for instance, we didn't incarnate on Earth, we incarnated in a different galaxy within the, the, the physical universe, and we, and we um, subsequently incarnated in, in a different frequency within that galaxy, we would be able to see and observe, let's say it's the fifth frequency, we would be able to see and observe everything in the fifth frequency and the fourth frequency and the third frequency and below and so the higher the frequency are you can see more of the content associated with what's on on the earth for instance uh, or, or other planets or systems or, or galaxies that are based upon the third and fourth frequencies from the fifth frequency but you can't see it in the sixth you can't see the sixth you can't see the seventh you can't see the eighth ninth tenth eleventh or twelfth this is because we have a demarcation between these frequencies. Now, in some cases, we don't have a demarcation. In some cases, they, a locally, a locally high frequency, uh, or, or or area within a lower frequency can be in contact with a locally low frequency within a higher frequency. And that's how sometimes we get this this merging, or, or, or where frequencies collide, so to speak, and we can move through different different frequencies, higher and lower frequencies, by using that this natural sort of phenomena, which is created by us as we as we work with that particular frequency. Um, or we can use some sort of mechanical means or um, higher energetic function to be able to create a, the ability to jump between frequencies. This is, this is only available to, to us, by the way, if we incarnate the frequencies around, well, quite high actually, uh, around about the, 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 the fourth and fifth above us you start to use mechanical means, but when you start to get into the 8th, ninth, 10th, etc. and above, you start to use more spiritual or energetic methods of doing things using intention. But in, in essence, what we have is the ability to see those layers or levels or frequencies and the content associated with those frequencies in the physical universe that, are, that, are, that you're on or incarnate on or into and below, but not those above because it's a different condition we are able to see what that which is below us or, we, or, or around us but not above us unless we work in ourselves it's a it's a it's a, it's a it's a universal law so basically everything that's on the earth now that we see now on the earth and the physical universe from our perspective is within the, the gross physical frequencies the first three frequencies and we can see these with our physical eyes and we know that our physical eyes are limited they have a visual range of between 400 and 700 nanometers, which is really small. And we also know that there are, uh, there are other things that can occur at slightly higher frequencies or slightly lower frequencies. So we have the infrared and the ultraviolet. And we, have ultra and we know that we can transmit things uh, and, and perceive things by having our machines working uh, sort of around those areas so we can uh, see through things by using x-rays, different versions of, it, of, of, of radiation being used. And we can also transmit on microwaves. 
or ultra high frequency rays or very high frequency radio waves. So we know that things do exist above our visual range, but we have to use me mechanical means to be able to access those. But all of these are still within the first three frequencies. They're not quite in the fourth frequency. So if there are things within the third, frequency, third frequencies that we can't see because they're slightly higher than the third frequency, and they're not into the fourth, then it stands to reason that there are things that are in the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh, up to the twelfth, that we can't see. And so it's, it's, it's about positioning of frequencies. Once we can position ourselves in different frequencies, we can access everything that's in a particular frequency that we put, that we put ourselves in. If we're on the 12th frequency, we see everything that's in, in, that's in the physical universe. And although right now when we look at the physical universe with um, the Hubble telescope, for instance, or other telescopes, uh, they can see long distances or, or, or close distances, we start to see lots of blackness in between sort of bright areas that we attribute to being galaxies. And there's billions of galaxies um, within, the, within the first three frequencies associated with the, the physical universe. And there's even more associated with the fourth and fifth and sixth, etc, etc, etc. So although we see mostly nothingness in between these little bright lights, which are galaxies, and nothingness in between the little bright lights, which are solar systems or suns and planets, when we go up the frequencies, we start to see this, these gaps, these darkness, if you want to call it that, filled in. So the higher the frequencies we go, the more content we see, not only in our own planet, because there are lot, there's lots of content on this particular planet, so the Earth, it's, it's a pan-frequential body, it exists on all 12 frequencies, and so therefore there are things here happening, beings, entities, uh, constructs um, that they use to ex experience and, and, and stay here, that are only available on those different frequency levels, or on those frequency levels and below, for instance. So, the higher the frequencies we go, we see more content. And so when we get to the twelfth frequency, this universe that we see is mostly black with the odd with the odd little bright dot of a galaxy, ends up being actually all white as an example, with very little black spots in between, if if any at all. And so, it is simply about accessing higher frequencies. Think of it as well a little bit like um, using your radio tuner. Okay when you select a radio station. Now with digital radio, it's difficult to understand it because we, we select a program, we select a station. But in the, in the old days of um, frequency modulation or, or amplitude multi, uh, modulation, AM and FM, we basically selected a frequency. And as we move from one frequency to another, you moved out of the ability to receive one radio station to a higher frequency where you'd receive another radio station. And you receive these radio stations in isolation, and that's exactly the same way as, we, in, as the frequencies in, in the greater reality work as well. The higher the frequencies they go, you can access different things, but whereas with the radio, with the radio system you can't access those stations below you because you're focused on one, on one particular frequency and therefore the radio station on a higher frequency, within the multiversal environment and certainly the physical universal environment when you're a higher frequency you can access everything below you as well okay so that's how the frequencies hide what's not visible it's simply a case of positioning frequentially and although we have an example with radio for instance and we have the example with the computer aided design it's actually a case of not separating things out but adding things on so as we go up the frequencies, we add our ability to see things at our level and below, but not above. Okay, so we don't go up to the fifth frequency and only see what's in the fifth frequency. We can, if we want to, only select what's in the fifth frequency, for instance, but we, we don't, we, we, we can do, but we don't tend to. We tend to sort of observe what's in the fifth frequency, but we can observe everything that's on the, that's on the fifth, fourth, and third. Sometimes when we get up the higher frequencies, we can separate ourselves out and experience only what's on those levels. Certainly in the fourth frequency, it's very much a case of you can see what's on the fourth frequency and what's here, and, so, and to some extent the fifth. When you get to the sixth, the entities there would tend to focus on the sixth only, and then at will, we'd be able to access that's on the fourth, uh, well, the fifth and the fourth and the third as well. Okay, and that's that particular lecture on how the frequencies hide what's not visible on the Earth and the physical universe. Um, now we've got a lot of questions actually, which I want, I want to go through. Um, there's probably around hmm, 
quite possibly 15 or 16 questions or more actually. So we'll, we'll, we'll move on quite quickly. And the first question is from FN. Uh, and there's 10 questions from FN, so that's the first uh, large chunk. And the first question is re relevant to Tom Campbell. Um, Tom Campbell's the author of My Big Toe. And, it's, uh, and the question is um, that uh, Tom Campbell says that mediums and other individuals who access dead people do not really access dead people. They only access the programming for that dead person because the program has all the information about our you know, example, Bob or, or Brian or, or Mary, and can send info to mediums to assist or guide others through, through mediums. Does this depict mediums uh, accessing correctly? Uh, please explain. Well, basically, it's another way of saying that the, the dead person, or should we say the personality associated with the dead person, that personality that's created through incarnation, that's associated with the sentience that's projected from the Trinity itself, is in essence the Trinity itself, or small part of it. So when Tom says we only access the programming, if you substitute the word programming for sentience, and then you, you understand that it's the sentience associated with that part of the Trinity itself which has been separated out to become incarnate, then it's the same thing. And also if you think of it in terms of the, and I think I'm going to have to add on the, uh, the presentation on who we are and how we incarnate to this, uh, this particular lecture because that explains a bit more about it. But basically, as we become disincarnate, we have a number of different, probably about six, of, I believe, um, might be seven, I can't remember, different ways in which we re-commune with our Trinidadic self. And one of those, in fact, there's, there's a couple of those, which means we, we maintain our individuality, but we either stay projected from the Trinity itself, or we enter a number of different forms of communion, where the sentience is, di is, is um, distributed or diffuse within the overall body of sentient energies that is the Trinity itself. And so if you get to the point where um, Bob in this example has gone into full communion with the Trinity itself, the Trinity itself, to enable the medium to be able to contact the sentience that was Bob, would need to reconstruct that sentience uh, in an individualized sense, temporarily, to allow that medium to access that which was Bob. Or in fact, the Trinity itself itself could access that which was done by that smaller version of its sentience, that smaller aspect of sentience whilst incarnate, to answer the questions on behalf of itself, the, it, itself being allowing a smaller part of itself to become Bob as well. So sometimes mediums do access the Trinity itself. So with, with the Tom Campbell example, try to substitute the words that are used. Try to substitute um, his description of it by, by saying programming to sentience and a small aspect of sentience which is separated out. Okay, right, the next question here. Um, and uh, I don't see where the, the uh, indication of where it came from was, but basically let's, let's, let's start with, the, with the, full, the full part of the question. The question is, you wrote that, simply put, when an aspect is connected to the true energetic self in this way, this must be um, in a form of communion, for instance, or, or, uh, or, or otherwise, it has access to all the information that the true energetic self has whilst in the communion with the source. Are we able to elevate ourselves as an incarnated aspect into this, into this, in this physical universe and connect to the true energetic self at a higher level of, frequent, of frequential state and access all the information available. Uh, yes, we can, but it's very hard because it's it. We are totally programmed, unfortunately, from birth to believing or even feeling that we know that the physical universe is all there is, and so we have to completely divorce ourselves or detach ourselves from this feeling. Meditate, meditate, meditate get to the point where we actually do manage to project our consciousness out of the body, lower form of that is astral travel, higher form is moving beyond that and traversing the different frequencies. And so then we can access the communication between us, other examples of aspects projected from our Trinitic self and our Trinitic self itself, and of course the source. So it's really about you know, working harder than ourselves. And the biggest enemy we have is mind chatter. So we have to really work 
very hard beyond that. You know, some people take 30, 40 years. Some people can do it in four months. It just depends upon how focused they are. Um, the rest of this question is, you wrote that you access this information because you are on, but that appears to be not the norm. How do we accomplish the same? Well, anybody who's dedicated can do it. I mean, there's clearly some of us are able to access it quite quickly. I actually took quite a long time. Um, although relatively speaking, compared to somebody who's taking 30 years, mine was quick. But it's, it, seem, it, it needs to be dedicated information. Blank mind, accept everything, but question everything. Dedication to understanding the information and working forwards. And, and having regular, regular meditations or practice on, on focusing and connecting with, with your true energetic self or source. Anybody can do it because we're all connected to a true energetic self. Anybody can do it because all of our true energetic selves are a smaller aspect of source. So in essence, we're all source. So anybody can do it. It just needs focus and the ability to detach from this particular physical um, aspect of what the source is in, in, in its multiversal environment. So question three, is the author Tom Campbell like you? He seems to give similar information in a more scientific and mechanical way. Can I elaborate? Um, in effect, Tom has found a way to link into the knowledge that's out there within the source that's accrued by other projected aspects on behalf of their true energetic selves, which is, which is accrued on behalf of the source uh, in his own way. And because of his training and his information, he's presenting it in that way. And this is important because really, we, we, you know, we all learn in different ways. We know this because, we st because when we go to college or school or university, some teachers ring true, the, the way they teach rings true with us and we, we get on well, we can understand the information easy. And some teachers don't teach us in the way we, we would learn and therefore we struggle to get uh, an understanding of the knowledge there. So it's, so it's in essence, he, he's not like me in terms of my heritage, but he's like me in terms of his ability to, to latch onto or to log into the information and present it in a way relevant to his, his own physical training. And I think that answers that question. Okay. Next question, what does this mean? As you're aware, there are various forms of free will that include various forms of collectivity as part of its functionality. And that's in the Kindle page 2595. Um, in effect, there are different forms of free will. There's different forms of collective free will. Now, totally individualized free will is what we're experiencing now. But there's other forms of free will that are not totally collective, but are assigned to a collective, where one example of almost total free will is where you have individualized free will, but you're governed upon how your actions and responses affect the rest of the collective. So you would naturally have laws within you that said, okay, if I do this, this is going to affect other, other individuals in this way. So therefore, maybe I'll do it a different way where it doesn't affect them too much. And that's what, that's what the sort of the higher end of, of sort of free will within the collective is. Um, other, other levels of free will would be, for instance, you're able to work in a free will way in a very limited context that allows you to do the work you need to do um, on behalf of the collective, but only in the way that is effective for the collective. And that means that you may, for instance, if you're a, if, uh, using the example of the body, human body, if you're a liver cell, you can do everything you want to do as a liver cell, but nothing more. That's the sort of idea. Whereas if you are a um, uh, another cell, for instance, like a brain cell, you have the ability to do everything you can do with it as a brain cell, but nothing more. Whereas if you are, <laughs> if you have other free will, the high, different level of free will, like for instance, as a cancer, you can create yourself to be something like a liver cell, but not perform like a liver cell quite, but be, 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 have that performance to be good enough to confuse the liver and the liver cells and the white corpuscles and the body's immune system to make you thinking that you're a liver cell, but you're not. So that's a little bit of free will. It's just outside of the total collective condition. So, this, so there's different types of free will. And the, I can't remember which book this is in, pr probably the, um, 
the origin speaks and, and, and probably even in the end dialogues. But it's worthwhile reading because free will is a, is a very interesting subject and the ways in which we incarnate in various different parts of the physical universe also dictate what level of uh, will we have, so to speak. Okay. Uh, next question, number five, is you wrote that not all aspects that are projected away from the main body of the true energetic self, energies have free will. So how could an aspect that is projected in this earth, physical life, be, be without free will? Ah, right. Um, what that means is that basically it's an aspect that's projected away from the main body of the, of the true energetic self um, may incarnate in a different location within the physical universe, a different frequency uh, and a different, obviously a different sort of planetary or galactic location, and they would not have uh, free will. Um, there are also aspects, of course, that don't have t um, total free will, and those are the animal aspects that are projected down from the the, the, the trinitic selves that don't have the same quality of sentence that, that our particular trinitic selves do. So they don't have the same level of free will that we do, so to speak. So it, this is the, the, and sometimes they don't have free will at all. And sometimes we have, and we have quite a lot actually, um, entities of a higher frequency, who've, who've incarnated at a higher frequency that are on the earth that we can't see because they're a different frequency, that also have no free will at all. They're part of a collective. Some of those beings we've, or entities we've, we've met, actually, um, I keep saying being an entity, but actually the, 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 they're different things. And those of you who remember the lecture on what's the difference between a being and an entity will understand that one's based upon being created by source or a function of source, such as, such as a true entity itself, whereas the other one is based upon the, 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 the sort of natural sort of Darwinian evolution of energies that group together um, and collect together and eventually have this uh, desire to to, to collect together and sacrifice that whatever individuality they had, i.e. as an individual energy, uh, to become part of a collective to create a bigger entity. Okay. Well, I hope that answers that particular question. Next question six is, what does this quotation mean? For example, the human vehicle is not only used on Earth. As you can see from the diversity of the human race, it is not possible for so many variants to come to the same planet, or to come from the same planet. Each of them has been used to seed the planet with a variant of the human form that was in harmony with the changes of the frequencies and the environmental conditions as they, the incarnate vehicles, descended the frequencies. That's, that's from page um, 3051 in Kindle. Well, basically, there are, there are other locations within this particular galaxy and other galaxies that are similar, so to speak, and where the the general human form operates well in. And so there have been times when those entities who were working with um, the opportunity to use um, individualized free will as, a, as an evolutionary accelerant on this particular planet, recognized that rather than redesigning the vehicle, they would be better off using an existing human humanoid type of vehicle that existed on other planets or galaxies that were that were of a, of a, a slightly lower frequency and so those those bodies were appropriated or transplanted onto the earth in preference to creating a new lower frequency vehicle one that was able to cope with the drop in frequencies and so there's been a number of different superseding humanoid bodies that have been transplanted on earth to if, if you want to cut this um, make a shortcut in the ability to have to redesign a body that's capable of, of working in lower frequencies. Now, some of these some of these vehicles obviously were higher frequency than where we are now. So, so for instance, Afro-Caribbeans or, or or the Asians or the Indians, for instance, they may have been a higher frequency. And then when you move down a lower frequency, those bodies would have been struggling to work here. So, in general, a lot of these vehicles. Um, started to misfunction or malfunction at these different frequency levels but we did have a form of darwinian evolution and so some of these bodies did in fact adapt over time or over event space to the lower frequencies and that's why we do have um, different vehicle types different skin colors different 
um, statures, so to speak, different, even different, slightly different genomes associated with those different body types that were that were transplanted on the Earth at different frequential levels, and they've managed to survive. And this is why we've still got the plethora of different bodies. And, um, and also, sometimes we do have um, bodies that are the third frequency level that have been transplanted here as well. Um, and this is where we, where we are with what, what we've got now. So the there are, there are bodies that are in between, so to speak, some of these, the major um, genomes, uh, and, and they're not specifically hybrids or, or, or mixed race marriage productions, for instance. They are simply that they have been transplanted from a different planet, but it's very, very close to the Earth. But, they, but when these incarnates have incarnated into those bodies, they wouldn't have had free will. The body isn't the vehicle that has free will. It's the sentience that has the free will. That's, that's, that's worth noting. So, based upon this, next question is, based upon what I read, it seems that an ancestral car makes no sense and it cannot, be, cannot, cannot exist. Is this a correct statement? Um, yes, and um, basically, ancestral karma is suggesting that we have taken on board karma from a family member. Well, we can do that if we wanted to assist a particular aspect of a particular trinitic self and, and remove that karma. Um, by acting out that karma for them or experiencing different things that negates that karma. But in general, we don't. In general, the karma, is, the karma or the addictions to or the um, needs to um, over, go over different functions of existence and, and create a better response to those different um, interactive condi conditions or environmental conditions we find ourselves in um, in a more effective and efficient way. So. It's generally what we've accrued and not what another entity's accrued that we are, um, that we're working with. <clears throat> okay. There are some brave souls who do come down and help other aspects out if they've got a, a, a lot of karma by taking on board some of their karma for them. And it may well be that that, by some strange coincidence, that that particular aspect was part of the same family line. I mean, bear in mind that family line and where the aspect comes from in terms of Trinity itself are not generally linked. Sometimes you get the odd condition where there's two aspects in the same family from the same Trinity itself, but that's extremely rare and, and not at all common. And so generally it's associated with the individual's um, aspect or soul. Okay. Next question. You said that master guides work with 12 guides in their wards and also their own 12 wards. Is that correct? That's, yeah, absolutely. Master guides are, I mean, this is a humanization of the words, really. I mean, clearly, clearly the word master is something which, which we use to, to show a demarcation and, and a level of function and, and, and responsibility associated with these entities that are in service to us by helping us navigate through incarnate existence to accelerate the accrual of, of evolution on behalf of um, our trinidadic selves and, of course, source and ultimately origin. Um, so, let me, let me read the rest of the question. Yes, if so, why master guides also get wards when they can only guide the guides? Well, they do get... Sometimes master guides are newly sort of... nearly achieve this level of responsibility, so they're still looking after their wards. A ward is an, ent an entity or an aspect that is incarnate. Uh, and sometimes they... They take on board the, the governance of a ward who has a very important thing to do, and so therefore it needs to have um, a, a, a master, you know, a master guide or somebody or, or a guide who has lots and lots and lots of experience and ability as well to be able to navigate or help that particular aspect or soul navigate through the, the important levels of responsibility and function it's got to do in this particular incarnation. And that's basically that's answered the next part of the question. What sort of um, wards do master guides manage? Usually, those aspects that have got a lot of important responsibilities to go through and activate through, and sometimes it can be a very very difficult life they have to go through. Um, these so-called so rags to riches, not specifically rags to riches financially, but rags to riches in terms of their um, intelligence or their ability to change the 
the lives of others and change the directions of others as well. Okay, so that's a very important to individuals usually. Um, next part of this is, I understand aspects may require, that's, that's a particular point in this incarnation. Oh, I'll start again. Why do some aspects have a number of helpers? I understand aspects may require that at a particular point in this incarnation. Why an so basically, why, is, why does an incarnation of 30 or 6 do more helpers and guides signify a specific task or a juncture for an incarnate? Uh, is an aspect com incompetent or in inexperienced to have to multiple guides or, or, or lots more um, helpers, basically? Or is the aspect too experienced and need multiple guides to achieve certain goals? Yeah, sometimes a multiple guide condition is only when you've got one guide handing over to another guide. For instance, if there's going to be an evolution jump in frequencies. Um, but the number of helpers, for instance, is, is specific to the, 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 the complexity of the, of the incarnate's the incarnate life plan. How many individuals they need to inter interact with, in what environments, and at what junctures within event space. And sometimes they need a lot, and sometimes they need only a few. And, and in real terms, we don't, there's no correlation either between the complexity, overall complexity, and the number of helpers. So if you think of it in terms of, well, this person's got a complicated life plan, they may only need to have six helpers. Whereas this person's got a very simple life plan, this person's got 30 helpers. But you can have somebody with a simple life plan that's got six helpers, and somebody with a complicated life plan has got 30 helpers. And it's to do with how they want to maintain that simplicity or that complexity. And how and how they're moving from one point to another point to inter interact and interface with others who are part of that life plan. If you think about it, sometimes somebody has to have a really simple incarnation and be keep kept away from the possibility of gaining karma because they're getting close to jumping from one frequency to another. They're getting close to having an evolutionary jump or even moving away from the need to incarnate. So these guy, these helpers, um, and maybe even a with, with two guides are being kept really close to the the goalposts, narrow goalposts associated with um, the glide path that is their life plan so that they don't stray. So they only do, they only do what they need to do and that's it. And that's why they might have a lot. Otherwise it could be that they've they're not particularly got, got to the juncture where they're jumping a frequency but the, life, but the life plan is simple and so they don't need a lot of, a lot of individuals. So, it's, so, it, so it, 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 there's no correlation in terms of numbers of, 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 of helpers or more than one guide versus the, the complexity or simplicity of the, of the life plan. Okay, last question, question 10. You also said the more advanced an entity is, the more evolutionary content it can accrue and therefore the more it can donate it to those who help it accrue evolutionary content, such as guides and helpers. Um, is this a reason why one expect could have a large number of guides and helpers? Um, that's in Kindle page 3789. Uh, no, basically uh, there is no correlation between the number of guides and helpers and the ability for an, an, a particular entity to, to accrue more evolutionary content than, than, than another. Although those guy, the, the guide and the helpers that are associated with that particular entity will benefit. Now, guides and helpers don't, aren't part of the evolutionary cycle, so they don't accrue evolution themselves per se by the work they do. But they can accrue um, evolution by the grateful response of a particular entity giving them evolution, so to speak. So it's not quite, it's not like a, an evolutionary tax, for instance, we, or, or paying for the service saying, oh, thank you for helping me, here's some evolution. It's simply a case of, well, I've accrued a lot of evolution here, and it, maybe it's more than I expected, so you can have some as well. And this happens a lot. And so basically, the guides and helpers, they evolve sometimes faster as a function of helping multiple wards than the actual wards themselves would do uh, on behalf of their true energetic self. Okay, so I hope, I hope that answers that question. Thank you very much.
um, FN for answering those questions, for asking those questions to me. Okay, next one's from EM, and it's another question about karma. And uh, it's read from the, the, the book Avoiding Karma. And the, the, the comment is here, the more my consciousness expands in this human experience, and this has already expanded, the more I'm told there is not really any karma, there is no resolving of anything. Karma has so many connotations, good or bad. If this happens to you, then this or that has to happen to balance you out. And this, this, this goes on and on. Even universal situations, in brackets, karma, are just an unfolding of consciousness. And it is all, that, and it is all perfect in its experiences. The I that is me is here to experience and manifest whatever it wants. And it is all beautiful, magnificent and magical. It leaves no residue behind that needs to be resolved because it is all of being played out in whatever form it takes. With this awareness, I no longer see karma only love acting out in its many forms. That is a higher level function. Uh, in, in essence, when you get start to get to that position, the attractivity, the addiction, so to speak, of that which happens in and around us whilst we're incarnate disappears. And we start to realize that <clears throat> everything is done by ourselves to try to evolve. And even when we're doing things that other people think are bad, for instance, or we, or we see other people doing bad things, we start to see these individuals and think, well, that they're doing their best to experience, learn and evolve whilst being incarnate. And so we, we look beyond the actions from a human perspective and we see it in a completely different way. We see it as being a function of the overall experience of the aspects of the Trinity itself, source and origin. And so we, we do then work in a completely different condition of love. And it's a much higher state of, of beingness than, we, than human love is. It's a, complete under, it's a level of complete understanding. And when we understand totally and we work in this level of understanding, the addiction or the attraction to low frequency thoughts, behaviors and actions disappears we interact with others in a, in a really efficient and perfect way. We experience experiences in an efficient and perfect way, and we don't get addicted to or attracted to anything. Once we've achieved this, we then move beyond the need to incarnate because we've mastered it. And then we continue to have our evolution progression in the energetic um, without, without any need to incarnate. One or two of us do come back once in a while or feel a need to, or sometimes say we're going to help out in a, in a, in a way which is um, benign, but ne nevertheless directional. But in general, once we've got to the point where we don't need to incarnate, we don't. Okay, good question, thank you. This is from MS, and it said, hi. Um, this is a question about abortion. It says, so how does abortion sit with the source? How does that affect the woman's life plan, their journey? Do some women choose to experience that in their life, or is it the choice of the baby's uh, or aspect or shard. Is it counted as karma? Again, you have to look at a higher perspective. It's, it's about experience. The individual mother might want to experience the gestation of, a, of, a, of, a, of another form within it, another, another incarnate vehicle within it for a certain period of time, and then no longer want to experience that as part of its incarnation. And similarly, uh, a an entity may wish to be associated with such a, a, a function of being part of the gestation of, a, of, a, of an incarnate vehicle up to a certain point and then detach from it. So it's not a condition of, um, shall we say, is it going to affect us from a karmic perspective? It's usually part of a plan, usually part of an experiential plan that both the, the aspect associated with being the, the mother and potentially the father and potentially the child uh, in its um, embryotic state wanted to experience in different ways. They all want to experience different aspects of that and then move on. We don't all want to experience a whole life. We don't want to experience being born, but we sometimes want to experience the condition of connectivity with that which could be born, for instance. Okay, so we've got some... Um, you know, various different things here, which are sometimes abhorrent to the human condition, but are actually very benign to us when we're energetic. Next question. Oh, this is from M.O. And this, uh, this is a, another wonderful person who is uh, translating 
um, working on translation the, what, one of the books, The History of God, into, into Japanese. So thank you very much. And there's a couple of questions here, and one's from an individual who's working uh, with MO. Uh, it's a hi again. Um, one of my friends who proofread the, tra the translated chapter of the history of God asked me to ask you this question. Okay, and the question is: I've heard that this is a holographic universe and created and created based upon mathematics. If so, does prime prime numbers have a pattern, or is it completely at random? And also, how do other alien races with higher technologies use prime prime numbers? Um, the the physical universe um, is part of the, of the multiverse environment, as we know. And so it is based upon a structure. And that structure is a function of source. And, that's, and source has a structure that's a function of the origin. And so with it being omnipresent, you could use the word holographic to describe it, because holographic is, is not two-dimensional, it's sort of three-dimensional from a physical descriptor, not a frequential or an environmental condition. So I'm not using the word just dimension here to describe a, a, an environment. It's a it's a state of solidness, <laughs> so to speak. Okay, so so holographic means within and without, everywhere. Okay, so these things can be described a number of different ways. And mathematics is one small and actually inaccurate, but nevertheless one way that is used by a number of different um, civilizations that are within the gross physical frequencies to describe it. Mathematics is just one way of describing things. It's quite so it's, it's inaccurate, but it's, but it's one of the purer ways. <laughs> so it's one of them, one of the more pure, inaccurate ways, so to speak. So maths can go a certain way, and then that's it. It fails to go any further, and the, and prime numbers are sort of a function of mathematics that are that are sort of recurring and pure so to speak the the function of 12 within and, and those numbers which are which 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 can be can be divisible within the 12 such as 1 6 2 3 and 4 and 12 itself are all parts of that 12 and then these this number 12 is part of the structure function of the structure of the origin source Genetic cells and ourselves as well, and so sometimes we do. We have to use some functions of maths associated with our structure to create that which we need to create. And sometimes the mathematics explains it, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, but so they. So sometimes these numbers are used as part of a standard function of understanding. And sometimes the mathematics associated with it is accurate, and sometimes it's inaccurate. Okay, so so, and also how do other alien races with higher technology use prime numbers? Well, they would use the, the, other alien races with higher technologies would move beyond these these things. They would go into a different state of understanding of the structure associated with the environment that they're in, that frequency that is part of the of the physical universe that they're incarnate into. To be able to create that, that which is there. Once you start to move with working frequencies and energies to create things, rather than basic manufacturing processes of cutting something or generating something, you start to use different functions above that which we which we would think about as being a um, a solid basic foundation of a particular level of understanding. In this instance, maths. Okay. Next part of this question is from the MO um, himself. Uh, the man asked this question is a cook, but we are very interested in physics. <laughs> Great. Um, and he would be delighted to know the answer. Well, I hope this answers the question. And it's great that you're a cook and that you are interested in physics as well. Metaphysics. Metaphysics is that which is beyond physical physics. OK, great. Thank you very much. Thank you for your interest. And thank you for helping to spread more levels of deeper understanding you don't have to be an engineer or a scientist to want to understand and to understand the greater reality. Okay, next question is from M.O. himself. Okay, congratulations on signing the contract with uh, Ozark. Thank you on the on the curators. And they're saying, I'm very excited to know that the curator is going to be published next year. It feels really long until the pub until the book is available for us. Unfortunately, this is a, this is almost a standard publishing time 
um, with, with my with my publisher. Massive, bigger publishers, huge publishers can can uh, truncate that time or, or make it smaller. But in general, there's a, there's about a nine month wait uh, time period between the acceptance of a of a book and it being on the shelves. Okay. So, okay, so the excitement is there, thank you very much. So what would you share that made you feel most excited to find out and why, and why while you were channeling information for this book is a teaser? Okay, so basically what was the most important thing that came out of this particular book? Um, I was amazed at the number of individual entities that had the ability to work with the different forms of event space and, and the different realities. That was the thing that, 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 that I found most exciting. And actually most concerning because I was really starting to wonder whether I was going in circles. But actually, when you look at it, and I don't even think I'm scraping the surface with the, with the information in the book in the slightest, but if you look at the different functions of event space and how it can change and how it's changed around us and the fact that it's fluid and that we change it and our guides and helpers change it and there are other entities that aren't, that are also of service, but they're maintain the structure of the multiversal environments and they also change it to affect more efficient interactions with the, the the content of the multiverse and the individual entities that are incarnate or disincarnate within the, within the multiversal environments can experience learn and evolve from it is amazing and it's not and so you start to think to yourself well <laughs> actually if, if everything is manipulated in such a way, is there such a thing as free will? And you start to realize that free will is sort of limited in all sorts of different ways. But we would need to understand that, you know, as we experience something from our individual linear way, other aspects of us are experiencing this different, this different experiences in different ways, in different realities, different event spaces in slightly different ways. So, then you start to understand that some of these things need to merge together, some need to split out, some need to form different versions of event spaces, and some need to create, some need to be terminated. <clears throat> and so, this is what these these these, these some, of, some of these curators do. And I was amazed to find out the number of different versions of event space, number of different versions of reality, or ver versions of realities or environments, and the different entities that are able to. to to manipulate these things or govern these things or, or maintain these things. That was the most amazing thing for me, so, so thank you. Okay, last question for us all. And I'm pleased that we're moving through quite fast actually, so I'm, I'm a bit um, bit pleased. This is from US, the, the, the lady who transcribes the, the, trans, the world satsanga for us. Um, and it's, hi guy, here's a question that addresses many serious health issues for which your guidance as a healer is needed. Okay, I'll do my best. Question, it's becoming increasingly clear that chronic inflammation is the root cause of many illnesses, including heart disease, many cancers, and the newly emerging epidemic of Alzheimer's disease. We, we know that a poor diet, lack of exercise, stress, genetic dis predisposition, and exposure to toxins can all contribute to chronic inflammation. We can make some lifestyle changes, e.g. Uh, anti-inflammatory diets, supplements, fasting, regular exercise, stress relief, adequate sleep, etc., to improve things physically, but more importantly, what could we do from the energetic perspective? Would you please give us more guidance and meditation to deal with this multi multifactorial condition such as Alzheimer's disease, which is not a single disease or one size fits all. It's more like a roof within 36 holes that are being plugged one hole at a time. <laughs> Sorry, pl so plugging one hole is not enough. How can we prevent or reduce its expression using energy healing even if it's part of our life plan, or at least in some parallel lives. Um, in, a, in, a, in some instances, Alzheimer's disease, um, whether it's related to things like dementia or, or Parkinson's related dementia, is, or, and, the, and the vast plethora of different versions that, that, that to move off the beaten track, um, can be associated with one's life plan, one's ability, one's desire to experience different levels of function, of sentient function, or um, conscious function as well. And also sometimes it can be associated with the, the way in which the aspect or soul is detaching itself from the incarnation, 
whilst still maintaining some level of connectivity with the incarnation. So you do get souls that start to reduce their sentience, the, the connectivity of the sentience to their incarnate vehicle uh, gradually, and that shows up in the ability for that um, body to appear to function properly in, uh, with, with this, with this from a from a consciousness perspective i'm not going to say from an animated perspective because they can still animate the body but it's from a conscious perspective like the like logging into different experiences that have been achieved previous you know either instantaneously like minutes ago or, or years ago so it's 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 a it can be attributed to the detachment of the soul gradually um before finally allowing the, the, the body to demise and moving back into the energetic but also there is a lot of it to do with the lifestyle not specifically associated with um, psychological issues although psychological issues associated with stress can create levels of what we call dementia or, or, or loss of memory that's basically due to just trying to do too much stuff <laughs> we can all experience that and so we have to write things down <laughs> which is good practice actually um, but, in, but, in, but the other side of it is the foods we're having now, I've said this many times, if you look back about 40 years on, on some of the television sitcoms, you see, mo or even the films, a lot of the actors are thin. Why are they thin? They're thin because they're eating whole food. They're eating food which they've bought from a greengrocer, from a butcher, from a, fr from a, a fruiterer, okay? And it's, it hasn't been treated with pesticides, it hasn't been preserved. It hasn't been pre-prepared. It is something we've made ourselves. We've made apple pie. We've made steak and kidney pie. We've made chicken pie. We've made uh, leek and leek and Stilton pies. We've, you know, we'll, <laughs> you know, we've made various different things you know, that are based upon us taking the raw ingredients ourselves and doing it. When we start to get prepared foods from supermarkets, where you've got pre-prepared pies, meals, you know, all these different things, the preservatives that are in them and the fat content that's in them is ultimately a level of poison. It creates disharmony within the body and the, the, the fats associated with them are more, are more easily absorbed. They're, they're a bit addictive to the body, so it absorbs their, them, those fats faster than it absorbs natural fats. And those natural fats... Or what we what we use um, as part of the the physical function of allowing the brain to be act as a cognitive vehicle for us to help to pass on the understanding of that which is the sentience from the court from the from the the, the aspect that sits that sits in the the, the soul seat what we sometimes call the core star um, in, in Barbara Brennan terms to being accessed and functioned um, through the the communicative core of the body which is called the brain and so we start to lose that ability and so the, the good fats are ignored in in favor of these these bad fats basically and so and this is because of the the, the preservatives that are there and when we exercise the body naturally uses the good fats to exercise but leaves the bad fats there so we, we have more difficulty in losing fat as well and all of this is, all, all the fatty, is, is, all these fats are used, or cholesterol, different types of cholesterols are used by the brain, uh, as, as a, a, on a higher level, um, to assist in the, the the connectivity between the sentience associated with the human form. And so we, all, we also get this, this this inability to connect from a physical perspective to a, to an energetic perspective as a, as a function of it, because it's it's, it's dysfunctional. It's um, the, the, the energies associated with this are not in are not in harmony with us, and so the, these pre-preserved foods that we're eating, and also a, pre, a, 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 a predominance in in the, in the taking of supplements, for instance, or medication, for instance, um, is also is also creates creates a disharmony as well energetically, and results in a lack of sentient functionality, uh, consciousness, if we want to call it from the, from the physical perspective. So really, we have to start to go back to basics food-wise, you know, really getting whole foods that aren't preserved, but which are cleaned uh, in a in a 
you know, very um, pr correct way that doesn't use preservatives or doesn't use chemicals, but he's allows us to remove any bacteria that's there. Sometimes bacteria is good for us. I mean, sometimes there's a good bacteria in yogurt, for instance, but also we have to make sure we understand which bacteria aren't good for us and what's bit, what is created through some of these different cleaning processes that use chemicals or what kills off certain bacteria that are good for us, but leaves bacteria that aren't good for us, for instance. So really remove stress for a start off. Um, remove the use of pre-prepared foods, start to create your own foods as well. And by, you know, taking basic raw, raw foods and, and, you know, going back to cooking properly or eating raw food, eating raw, for instance, raw vegetables is superb. We eat fruit raw, don't we? Generally, don't we? So raw vegetables, raw fruits, paying attention to the fact that some of the coverings on, on fruits and vegetables are good for us as well. And also moving away from doing too much work, getting regular sleep and regular exercise as well. So there's a whole bunch of different things there. But the big thing is go back to moving away from pre-prepared and preserved foods. That's the big one. Okay. So that answers that question, I feel, and allows us to go to the last part of the satsanga, which is uh, to do with... Let's have a look. Helping us make the right decisions in life. Okay, so this is really is using your introduction, using your intuition, using your ability to understand and log into self. Okay, so let's close our eyes. Put our if we're sitting, <coughs> if you can find a straight back to chair, that's perfect. We sit with your feet flat on the ground back straight, spine straight, neck straight, eyes closed, palms uppermost on your upper thighs, closed eye vision focused on the location of the third eye, okay, which is not the same as the third eye chakra or spiritual or sixth chakra, it's in the same location but it's not the same as, so that's in between the two eyebrows and above the bridge of the nose. And I want you to put yourself in a position where you have three choices in front of you. Okay. One choice being the correct choice. One choice being nearly correct, but slightly desirable. And one choice being very desirable, but incorrect. So the middle choice, the second choice, is sort of a bit towards the correct choice, but also have, has aspects of the, the desirable, but incorrect so to speak. And just see these choices in front of you, these three choices in front of you. They don't need to be in that order. But whatever choices you've put down, whether it's buying something or experiencing something or saying something, or doing something in a certain way. Just put yourself in the position where you don't know any precognition or pre-understanding of the correct way. You just have these three choices. The correct way, the desirable wrong way, and the way that's in the middle. And just feel the lure towards doing the desirable way. 
Body is, we use desire to achieve things. Desire, intention, thought, action, and the product of the action, okay? Is the usual equation, if you want to call it that, from a linear perspective. But desire can also be like a lure. It can be the persuasive route, the addictive route. The route that feeds the ego. The route that feeds the material desire to have more. The route that gives you status. It could be even saying something to people. I'm better than you. In by illustrating something that you've done or achieved or have that is better than somebody else's just as illustrated, achieved or done. In using that example, let's just say that somebody has said something and you can relate to it. Let's just say they've experienced flying on a brand new airplane. Let's say it's this three, Airbus 380 with the, the two decks, the two levels. And they've been in the premium economy class and they're really excited about going in the premium economy class. And how much room they've got and how good the service was and how silent the plane was and how it absorbed turbulence how wonderful the experience was. The incorrect route would be to say, oh, I've been on one of those and I've been business class or first class. And it was this, that and the other. And we were going on an expensive holiday, for instance. And so therefore your response has been egotistical. The middle of the road route would be to say, yes, I've been on one of those. And it was the most enjoyable experience as well. This is also ego. It's not quite as big egotistically as the first response, the, undes the desired response, so to speak, that is incorrect, but it's showing equality with the individual. I'm as good as you. The best response will be to simply acknowledge that they've experienced it by saying, oh, how wonderful, and um, ask them a bit more detail what they've experienced, how they experienced it, what they did, what films they did. Letting them share what they've experienced. Having experienced the preferred, the best solution, the in-between solution where you try to, to become equal with the individual and the desired solution, this egotistical, where you're trying to be better than the individual who you're communicating with. Feel the energy associated with them. Feel how the best way, you know the best way. You feel it in your heart of hearts. You feel it in your intuition. But feel how there's a desire there, a strong desire that overrules, almost overrules, and will do, would you let it? You will need to work with the best solution and pulls you into the I'm better than you. Yes, I'll be in business class on that, those planes. 
I've been to an expensive holiday location. Almost equal in that pull, but not quite, is the need to corroborate, to collude, to give the middle response of, yes, I've been on one of those as well, putting the equality there, taking the energy out of the feeling of, I'm sharing something that I've experienced that I feel is special, and I'm really pleased to have experienced it. Feel the energy associated with going the wrong way, but is alluring and addictive. Colluding. And simply acknowledging the person has had a good experience and letting them take all the credit for that experience. Feel the different energies associated with those three different routes. This could be the same thing in buying something. Do you need it? Is it useful? Or are you just storing or hoarding something? Or is what you're buying supporting your ego? It's nice to have the odd toy, so to speak, but only if the toy doesn't govern you, doesn't create an ego. If you enjoy using it and that's it, and it doesn't have any control over you, that's fine. If you enjoy using it and it controls you and it's something that you use as a vehicle for ego, that's something else. Feel the energies over those basic choices interacting with somebody. The way that you know is the right way to answer. The way that you know is collusion. The way that you know is being better. Better than the person who's, who you're interacting with, the ego side. And then give yourself time to stop and detach from either the collusion response or the desired egotistical I'm better than you response and simply acknowledge that, that person has experienced something in which is in their minds wonderful. Even if it's not the same as your experience. It may even be that there's you having a discussion and you know something that the other person doesn't know and therefore you may be right. The desired aspect is to fight and fight until you're right. The collusion is to say the yes but. The correct response would be to offer the potentially correct response, but if they don't accept it, let them go. Let them go with the way they want to go, with the information they want to have the, as their, their way of feeding their own reality. Just feel how each of these different directions feels. This is your overall sentience, your clear sentience. Not just intuition, which is general knowingness, but clear sentience. Feel the result of the action. Giving yourself to self time to feel the result of the action makes you ultimately choose the correct, the correct response.
And so use this method every time you have a, a need to make a choice. Be the one that makes the right choice, not the one that makes the collusive choice or the desirable or egotistical choice. Other parts of you will do that anyway, because we all have, <coughs> when we t have a choice to make, we create little parts of ourselves move off into different event spaces and different, different event streams associated with those differences in, in response. But be the one, be the events in the event space and the event stream that made the correct decision. Don't attribute, don't attribute ego to it. I'm always making the right decisions. That's ego as well. Just allow yourself to make the most economical, efficient and correct response that allows you to navigate through this incarnation in a karma free way. Because the collusion and the desire is a thought and a behaviour associated with being in the physical. So detach from it. And navigate through your incarnation in a seamless way. Okay, so having experienced the energies associated with these choices, slowly remember them. Log them away somewhere, write them down if you need to, how you felt, what was going through your mind, the temptations associated with going the, the desired egotistical route, or the need to collude. Or simply being neutral and letting them get on with it and letting them experience and espouse what they've experienced. Okay, so slowly come back into the room once you've made a note of all these things in your mind and open your eyes. If you want to, you can write these experiences down so you can refer to them later. Okay. Well, that's the end of this um, satsanga on the 24th of November 2018. And um, just to reiterate what satsanga means, uh, well, sangha is like meeting, okay? It's, um, it's, it's a Hindu word, and so is sat. And sat, sat is the way of saying God or God consciousness. And so satsanga means we're in God consciousness together. So a world satsanga means that we're all on the world, in the world, um, in God consciousness together. So I hope that helps you understand the word satsanga. I'm sure there's a deeper Hindu meaning associated with it as well, but that's the that's my loose understanding. Thank you everybody for listening in. Thank you all for um, wanting to understand a bit more of the greater reality. And uh, thank you for um, listening to and reading the transcription, which US will do. And thank you for Kevin for um, putting it on his YouTube channel later and, ha and allowing a different uh, medium of dissemination of the information as well. Thank you everybody and uh, blessings to you all, God's love to you all and I look forward to presenting December's Satsanga to you uh, in a month's time.